Welcome back. Welcome to Portland Bible Church. If you're just joining us, this is our second service. On Sunday, we have services at 10 and 11.15. Uh, we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Thank you so much for joining us, those who are here in person, and those on Facebook, Judy Glennie, my wife, Judy Glennie's Facebook page. We have services live there, and also you can go to our website, portlandbiblechurch.com, and at the top of the home pages, it has services, and there's a drop-down menu there, so you can link to YouTube. We have some people that don't go on Facebook, some that go to YouTube. We're trying to look for some other uh, services, Rumble, and a few of those that uh, other colleagues of mine use, so we'll see what we can do to broaden our base, but God has allowed us to reach out, really, not only all over the country, but in foreign places. Uh, we have our Pastor Bamuleka over there in Uganda. Hi, guys. Uh, he has a church over there and an orphanage, just, just a wonderful minister over there. And uh, we've got the church in Iowa that tunes in. we got a church in Atlanta that tunes in and some folks down in Houston, to Colorado, California. So God has just opened the door. We are so grateful for people that have tuned in and joined with us. Uh, we were discussing one of the ladies from Houston called me just uh, the other day, and she listens to Robbie Dean. Robbie Dean's down there in Houston, West Houston Bible Church. Church, and of course, uh, Baraka Church down there with uh, Bobby Thiem. And uh, so we have uh, uh, Andy Woods, who's the dean of Chafer Seminary. And of course, they have those conferences and the pre-trib <laughs> conference and uh, Tommy Ice, all these uh, guys, just great, great Bible teachers. So there are many. And the seminary, Chafer Seminary, has young men preparing for ministry. So if you are needing a pastor, you need to contact uh, the Chafer Seminary. You can go online, Chafer Seminary. They probably have some men that are prepared. They've studied the original language. They're ready to go. And we need all hands on deck right now. All the pastors that I know, my colleagues, are all online. And so we praise the Lord that he has opened the door. Um, some of it, I think, uh, through this virus over the last couple of years has caused many of us to have an online ministry that we never thought about before. So God has taken what many tried to curse us with and turned it into an incredible blessing. We have probably four or five times as many people uh, viewing and attending than we ever had when we were just in a building. So we thank the Lord for that. Thank you for joining with us. Uh, also, we mentioned the fact that uh, there's a great program on TBN, uh, the Rosenberg Report. Some of you are familiar with Joel Rosenberg. He's written a number of incredible books that were fiction, but they turned out to be prophetic. And so uh, he just has an ear, and he loves the Lord. He's a, he's a messianic uh, Christian, and he, of course, has been uh, able to visit with many world leaders and uh, the, the things that he talks about, how many Hebrew people are coming to faith in their Messiah. Thousands are coming to faith. Good news. There's good news out there in spite of what you get in the mainstream that's kind of uh, depressing and uh, bad news. There is good news. You want to hear what Joel uh, Rosenberg has to say. Also, the fact that many Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, he gives you kind of a play-by-play -play of what's going on in the, in the Middle East now. Uh, we have the Word of God, what happened in the past historically, and what's going to happen in the future according to the Word of God. But Joel's given you what's happening right now, so keeps you up to date and gets the information you won't get anywhere else. Also, by the way, if you're interested in giving to the Ministry of Portland Bible Church, you can do that. Send the check to my address. Make sure you put Portland Bible Church on the envelope and on any checks or whatever. You put Portland Bible Church. I don't handle any of the money. Uh, we don't even solicit funds. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you feel according as the Lord has purposed in your own heart, so give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're on the grace basis basis, free will, grace always, grace in faith, and believing grace in giving. God is able to make grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good work. So keep that in mind. Pray about it, if you will. Uh, God has 
blessed us financially over the many, many years and even over these last several years with the uh, adversity we faced in our country. So we thank you. Thank you so much for that. We always take a few moments at the beginning of each and every class so that we can acknowledge or confess any sins that we're aware of. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit has a ministry not only to unbelievers to cause them to recognize their sin, but also for believers so that we can acknowledge our sins to God the Father. John in his first epistle says, if we as believers confess our sin, he means there, if we name, cite, agree with God that it's sin, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The sins are forgiven because of the work of Christ on the cross. We acknowledge that work on the cross retroactively, and the sins are forgiven and forgotten. By that means, we have the enabling of the Holy Spirit or the filling, as Paul tells us, because we're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we take time for that function to acknowledge any sins that we're aware of and confess them. Uh, if not, otherwise prepare your hearts and minds in the usual manner for the study of the Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a pleasure it is to fellowship with believers of like mind who love you, who study your word, who hope to advance spiritually from grace to grace, to obtain in this life the blessings that accrue to us because of our faithfulness, even through faith, even through your Holy Spirit and your word, and for those blessings and rewards that will accrue to us in the life to come in the resurrection. We look forward to these things. We look forward to your Son, Jesus Christ, as he will come to take us to our heavenly home, that we might always be with him. We thank you for the future that is bright from the standpoint of scripture, that we will go to be with our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to take us as his bride collectively, and that we will become the bride for all eternity, and that we might share in the glory and the judgment of the nations as well as the reigning throughout that kingdom and on into eternity. What a marvelous thing. I know we haven't even begun to imagine the things that you have prepared for us, Father, but we anticipate them and we look forward with hope and expectation and joy as we look to the future, not being distracted and uh, discouraged by the situations in which we find ourselves from time to time. Help us to do that now as we study, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth in this second hour to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 9. We are looking at a section here dealing with a great uh, believer of antiquity, Abraham, originally known as Avram or Abram, and later his name was changed to Avraham. Avram in the Hebrew means the father of the high places, and of course the high places were in Ur of the Chaldee, where they worshiped pagan deities. But God called Abraham and told him to leave his home and his family and to head for Israel, what we understand is Israel today. That was the land that was promised to him in those days under something we call the Abrahamic covenant. It was the covenant God made with this individual. Later, his name was changed to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Part of the package we call the Abrahamic covenant indicated that he would have uh, a great people, a great nation, and nations, plural, would come out of him and that all the nations of the world would be blessed in him, and also that he would have a land, a land for all eternity. We understand that as the land in the millennial kingdom. We noted in the last hour from the from the river of Egypt, that right, right where the corner of the Mediterranean turns north, all the way to the Euphrates River, uh, and all the way north to Hamath, that area uh, forms kind of a geometric trapezoid. I'm a math person, so forgive me. Uh, trapezoid has parallel sides, and then the two other sides are kind of at an angle. If you measure that, 
in terms of the map, it's around 180 to 200,000 square miles. Israel is going to have all of that land in the kingdom. So those who believe that Israel is finished and that God has forgotten Israel, Paul says, may it never be that in the final days that Israel will be delivered physically. They will go into the kingdom and be the inhabitants during that future kingdom. And of course, they will also be saved to get into the kingdom. So all Israel, Paul says, will be saved. So the future is bright. In spite of what you may hear or in the news uh, or people tell you, the word of God gives us hope and expectation of an incredible future. And we need to deal with the situations that we find ourselves in through, just as Abraham did, faith. Faith is the key. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have over 20 individuals here that are mentioned, 20 by name in the chapters, uh, in this chapter in Hebrews 11, and they are faithful believers. We noted, if you were here in the last hour, uh, that Abraham went out. First of all, he was called, invited, and then he obeyed, that is, he believed, and then he went out. He put his faith into action, and his action was he went out from the place that he was in to the place we know it is Jerusalem and the surrounds, to the place that he didn't know. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know how it was going to accomplish or what would be the end result. But God said, I'm going to make you a, a mighty uh, uh, people out of you, a nation, and mighty people, and kings will come forth from you, and you'll have this wonderful land. So he had the promise. He just didn't know where or when. Well, I guess he knew where it was in Jerusalem, but he hadn't been there. He'd been in Ur of the Chaldees, down around the Persian Gulf there uh, in the area uh, today of Iraq. And so he uh, basically, he didn't know where he was going. And we mentioned the principle in the last hour that that's the whole point of faith. Sometimes God asks us to do something through his word uh, and through the spirit, and we understand we're supposed to do something, but we don't know where, where we're going or what we're supposed to do. And we are led by faith. It's a life of faith. Hardest thing we have to do. People like to live by, as they say, the seat of their pants, uh, pick themselves up by their own bootstraps. We live by faith. We trust that the Lord knows what we should do, where we should go, when we should go, and how we should go there. And Abraham had knew none of that. He knew kind of the ultimate direction, but he hadn't been there. And so he went to a land he knew nothing about. And that's where we left off in this last verse, verse 8 there. It says that uh, he received this place that he was going to receive an inheritance in the future. And uh, he went out, not knowing where he was going. The next verse, of course, uh, picks it up from there. And so we come into verse 9. But just before we go into verse 9, I wanted to pick up the one thing there. And that is that uh, uh, in John chapter 14, verses 4 through 7. So hold the place and go there to John chapter 14. You know the passage, I think. It's part of what we call the upper room discourse. It's what Jesus taught actually from, from chapter 13 all the way through chapter 17 is the teaching that Jesus did during that last supper. So uh, when we take the communion, we usually do it within an hour. Just imagine Jesus at the Last Supper. He had all those chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five chapters, or at least four, and then the prayer perhaps uh, at Gethsemane where he prayed, but he may have prayed that uh, in their hearing as well. And so we have those chapters, part of the upper room discourse, as it's called, when they shared the communion and he uh, took those elements referring to his death, his burial, resurrection, and also to the fulfillment of the uh, covenant that was given to Jeremiah, the so-called new covenant. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood, you'll remember. And so in John 14, chapter, uh, chapter 14, verses 4 through 7. Now the first verses, I love those, so we'll read those. It says, let, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Well, but I'll try not to get distracted, but how do we get saved? We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in me. That's what Jesus said. And John says it 14 times. I'm sorry, 99 times in his gospel. Believe, 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 believe. Uh, but these evangelists today will do anything about giving the gospel except to tell people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It troubles me no end. Uh, my colleagues, of course, uh, do give the gospel correctly and believe in Jesus Christ. In my father's house are many dwelling places. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. So it's true. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will prepare and prepare the place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. Rapture of the church. Not coming here, but we're going to meet him. And so he's going to receive us to where he is. Uh, so he says uh, to myself that where I am, there you may be also. But then verses 4 through 7 read this way. And you know the way where I'm going. Sounds like uh, Abraham. And what did Abraham do? He didn't know where he was going. And so here we have Thomas. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? You know, that's kind of us sometimes. Lord, I don't know where I'm going. He goes, well, just trust me. Place your faith in me. Study the word. I'll give you the divine guidance you need to know where you're going, when you'll get there, what you need to do. In fact, if you have any adversity, he'll tell you what to say and how to heal with, handle that when it comes. And Thomas says this to him. But what did Jesus say? The famous quote in John 14, 6, he said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he continues to verse 7, he says here, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. People say, well, I just, if I, I live a good life, I'll come before the Father and uh, let him judge. There's no way. The only way to Father is through the Son. And if you don't know the Son, then the judgment will come through the Son, because the Father has given all judgment to the Son in John, the Gospel of John. And so he says, if you'd known me, you, you, uh, you would have known me. I'm sorry, let me start over. If you would have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Wait a minute. Well, the book of Hebrews, we noted in the first three verses of chapter one of Hebrews says he is the express image of the Father. He is the radiance of the glory of the Father. We're studying the glory of Jesus Christ on Thursday, if you join us, and we're looking at a special new presentation of the glory of Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate glory of Jesus Christ in eternity past, the glory he obtained through the work of the cross, the glory that he now has at the right hand of the Father, which glory we as believers will share with him. I don't even know what that means, but it's going to be wonderful. And so we look forward to that. So we see that uh, the disciples, at least I'm sure they all had the same thought, but uh, uh, we have Thomas who, as we call him, the doubting Thomas, he, he speaks up, he says, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And the rest of them are probably nodding their head. Yeah, I don't know where you're going. And that's when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's the context of that verse. So the point is, Abraham didn't know where he was going, but we do. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when someone says, well, I don't know where I'm going, say, oh, well, I can tell you the way. I know the way. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He'll tell you where you're going, what you're going to do, because you believe by faith. All right. So that takes us through this verse 8. And I wanted to finish that as we closed it out. If you want the rest, uh, you can go back to the previous hour online at uh, portlandbiblechurch.com, YouTube, or you can go to Judy Glenny's Facebook and pick up. By the way, we have almost 400 hours or maybe a little more that are on view on Facebook. All of them are there. So if you people say, well, I need to have some Bible teaching, I got 400 hours for you. Okay, you can go back and we've got many other uh, teachers like myself, colleagues that do an excellent job. I mentioned some at the beginning. All right, the next one here uh, continues on with Abraham and it says again, by faith. We have here the instrumental of means, the means whereby Abraham did everything that he did. Now, lest you think Abraham was without sin, that's not true. If you read those chapters, we noted quite a few chapters uh, in the first hour dealing with Abraham and the fact that Abraham obviously did things that were not uh, good. And so we saw that. I was trying to see if I can pull those verses up, but uh, we had, uh, we said the 14 chapters in Genesis. So in Genesis chapter 11, 27 through chapter 25, 18, we mentioned in the first hour, there are 14 chapters that deal with Abraham and he did some things wrong. He made some mistakes, but of course he was called the friend of God because he recognized his sin. And just like David, who sinned and nevertheless was called a man after God's own heart, it wasn't because he never sinned, 
but because he recognized when he had sinned and he confessed it. We have several psalms that indicate the psalm, uh, the prayer of confession that David made because of his sin. And so we see that these Old Testament saints were not perfect human beings. We're not perfect. We commit sin. We have an old sin nature that produces the uh, tendency towards sin. And then by will, <laughs> many times we act upon it. But we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have access to the throne room because we're believers. And we can confess that sin or sins moment by moment, First John 1, 9. So at any rate, we have it. And yet Abraham is mentioned here as the one who had faith. In verse 8, verse 9, by faith, Abraham sojourned. That's kind of a King James uh, word. It means he lived uh, in a location. It's the Greek word para oikeo. Para means alongside of. Oikeo means a house. To live alongside of a house, well, uh, that would mean you're not in a house. You're alongside of the house. Well, it comes to mean sojourn. It's like when you leave your house, you're sojourning. If you go to the market, you were on a sojourn. We don't use that in English so much today. He was on a trip. We took a trip. And so he took a trip all the way from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran in the north and then eventually to Jerusalem. And part of his failing was he went down to Egypt. Along the way, if you read those chapters, you'll discover the things that he did that were wrong and that he had to confess as sin. So he sojourned. We have the aorist active indicative in the Greek uh, uh, grammar. The aorist tense means a point in time, but it actually looks at the entirety. It's what we call a constative aorist. It indicates the entirety of his journey as one unit. The active voice, he is the one who did it. Once again, the writer of Hebrews does demonstrates the validity and the historicity of the Old Testament. The indicative mood is the mood of reality. There really was an Abraham. He really did leave Ur of the Chaldees. He really, by faith, sojourned, and that's what we have here. And where did he sojourn? Into the land. Into the land. The definite article is here. In the first hour, we noted a point of grammar in Greek. The definite article indicates specificity. And so it's the land that would refer to the land of promise, the land of his inheritance. And that, of course, starts in Jerusalem and the surrounds. But according to the passages we studied in Genesis in the last hour, it's everything from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates River, an incredible over 180 plus thousand square miles Israel will possess in the future. They have a tremendous blessing. And he went into the land. Ice in the preposition in Greek, E-I-S, the land. And so he went into the land of the promise. Once again, the definite article of the promise. And here we have a descriptive genitive which talks about what the land was. The land was promised to Abraham. We saw that in Genesis. So very clear, the writer of Hebrews understands not only grammatically, but the historic reality of Abraham's call, of his obedience, and his sojourning into the land of the promise. I didn't talk about the promise per se, uh, but we uh, mentioned several other passages. In Genesis chapter 12, we looked at the Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 7, but uh, hold the place and go back to Genesis 12, 8. Genesis chapter 12, 8. You can read these whole sections, but I'm highlighting several verses. Genesis chapter 12, 8. We noted the uh, basis of the covenant in verses 1 through 7. But look at verse 8. And then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, the house of God, north of Jerusalem, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west. And Ai, or I, which is, of course, uh, in Jordan, and that was the place that they took over, and they conquered Ai, as you know. And so uh, they went and did that in the east. And there they built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Notice the calling on the Lord is something you do as a believer. I know people go into Romans and say, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. That passage is not for unbelievers. They're already saved. You can't call on the Lord 
unless you've believed. If they read the entirety of Romans 10, you'll see how can they call on him in whom they have not believed. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted or accredited to him as righteousness, imputed to him, just as we have imputed righteousness at the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. And so then he could call on the name of the Lord. That's prayer. And so he had this offering of the altar. He understood the uh, principle of sacrifice long before the Mosaic Covenant specified the details of the sacrifice. Obviously, it was explained to Adam and all of his descendants down through Abraham. So it doesn't have to explain it. It simply says he sacrificed. He had an altar and obviously he would sacrifice. So we have that. And then over in chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. And he went. There's the journey on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel, house of God in Hebrew, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. So he journeyed, went around the land. In fact, God said, walk around there. Walk to the east, walk to the west. You've got all this land and a lot more, of course. He didn't go all, all the way back to the Euphrates, but that was his point of origin in Ur of the Chaldees over there in the area of Iraq or Persia in those times. So uh, three through five, we see this. And then it says, uh, uh, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. We noted that in verse 8 of uh, chap the, uh, chapter 12. And so it says, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And then, of course, we have the situation with Sodom and Gomorrah and a nephew Lot and so forth. But then go down to verse 13, uh, 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 rather 14 through 18. Uh, 14 through 18. This is actually the third visit that God made with Abraham. In other words, he spoke directly to Abraham, just as he spoke directly to Moses. You'll remember Moses spoke to God first in the burning bush, a theophany, a picture of Jesus Christ as a burning bush. That's a real interesting one in itself. And the voice came out of the bush. So Jesus Christ, before he came in the incarnation through the virgin birth, appeared in the whirlwind. He appeared uh, above the dais to Ezekiel, all of these kinds of things. And he appeared to Moses uh, as a, an after trail. And of course, uh, when Moses was in the cleft of the mountain, but apparently talked to Abraham as well. And so it says here in his third appearance, and discussion with Abraham, verse 14 of chapter 13. And the Lord said to Abram, hasn't had his name changed yet. Lot had separated from him. Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the lands which you see, and I might add, <laughs> which you can't see probably, all the lands that you see, he says here, I will give to you and to your descendants until the church age. No, forever. Hello, all you replacement people that believe that the church replaced Israel. This was Israel. Israel's Israel. The church is the church. We're the bride of Christ. Israel, the wife of God in the Old Testament. Two distinct entities. They're going to have forever the land. We don't inherit the land of Israel. That's the promise to, to the Hebrew people through the Abrahamic covenant. We get the overflow ble blessing as a spiritual children of Abraham, but we don't get the land. We get rulership. We get other rewards, uh, decorations and uh, wreaths of victory and so forth at the judgment seat. But we don't get the land. Israel gets that land through the thousand year millennial kingdom. All right. So uh, we have this verse and it says, uh, uh, through the th and walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. And Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron. And there he built an altar. We might say another altar. And then, of course, there's the combat situation uh, with the five kings against four in the next chapter and his meeting with Melchizedek. We've studied Melchizedek in the past. Hope you were with us for that. My thought is that Melchizedek is none other than Shem, one of the three sons of Noah, who was the great high priest who lasted 
all the way into the time of Abraham. He was about 500 years old. He was getting up there in years, you know. Uh, <laughs> Abraham, he was still a young person in the, in his mere hundred or so, you know, just over that. But he would have met with Shem, and I think Shem has a title called Melchizedek. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Melik is king. Tzedek is righteousness. King Melchizedek. It's kind of like Pharaoh. Shem was called Melchizedek. Jesus referred to him uh, in the New Testament, and uh, his his priesthood is after the order of the uh, people from the time of Abraham and all, and even before, because Shem goes back pre-flood, and therefore, obviously, the priesthood of Melchizedek supersedes, and I might say precedes the priesthood of the Mosaic Covenant under uh, Moses and uh, Levi uh, and, uh, and Aaron. Okay, so by faith, he sojourned, that is Abraham, or Abram, we should say, into the land of the promise, we noted that, as a foreigner dwelling in tents. Well, we noted that in Genesis 12 and 13, this idea of dwelling in tents. He moved around a lot. Dwelling in tents. And so a foreigner, I like the word foreigner, uh, ala trias, which means a stranger or a foreigner. We often think about foreigners as not belonging, and yet uh, Abraham was a foreigner. And God promised him a land that really was inhabited by others. And eventually they would have to be dispossessed. And eventually they would be. When Moses first went in, uh, he was given the commission to take the land. But because the spies said there's giants in the land and they're very frightful, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And so they didn't go in. And so those spies that didn't get to go in, but Joshua and Caleb said, we can take them. And later on, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones of those spies and the younger generation who went in to take the land under Joshua. The land that was promised to Abraham uh, and, of course, uh, to Moses. But Joshua was the one who got to go in and win the victories uh, of the land and establish the tribes, the tribes of, of uh, Jacob's 12 tribes in those lands and parceled out the land. But this covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, it also says that he dwelt with his son Isaac and his son, that is Isaac's son, Jacob. And so they dwelt together. Now, this Abrahamic covenant was spelled out to Abraham, and we've noted those passages in the last hour. It was restated again to Isaac and then restated again to Jacob. Uh, Isaac's name means laughter. <laughs> and the reason it's called laughter is because Sarai, before her name was Sarah, uh, which means princess, Sarai means the one who argues. <laughs> and so you want your name to be Sarah, not Sarai. At any rate, she laughs. She thought, I can't have a child. I'm 90 years old, for heaven's sake. Actually, 89. Uh, and she couldn't have a child. And she laughed. And the Lord was there with Abraham and said, Why is Sarah laughing? And Abraham looked around and said, I didn't see her laughing, and the Lord saw her. She was at the tent door, and she was laughing. I can't have a child. I'm nine. I'm 89 years old. You know. So, uh, but uh, so uh, a year later, we have uh, laughter. That's her son Isaac. Yitzka means laughter. I love that. And then, of course, his son later on, Jacob. Yaakov means chiseler. There was Jacob and Esau, you remember. Uh, they were twins. And, of course, Jacob's hanging on to Esau. And uh, uh, Esau was the firstborn. But Jacob got the blessing because Esau, like sometimes children, one child will go the way God wants and the other child not so much. Just like uh, Isaac and uh, uh, Ishmael. Ishmael, not so much. Kind of was a, a real, one of those disobedient children, shall we say. But nevertheless, God blessed him because he was under the Abrahamic covenant. But the blessing went basically through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the writer of Hebrews notes that historic accuracy here with Isaac and with Jacob. Turn with me to Genesis 26. We're filling in the details here because most people wouldn't do this. They just read through here and pull out a principle or two. But we're Bible students. We study the Bible verse by verse, category by category, person by person. Isaac is described with regard to the Abrahamic covenant and its extension through Isaac, through Jacob. Isaac in 26 of Genesis. Genesis 26, 1 through 5. In Genesis 
chapter 26, 1 through 5. Now there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine which had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. Already you know there's a problem here, but that's another time for another story. It says here, uh, So, uh, and the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants... I give all of the lands, plural, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me. Boy, there's a key word we could spend an hour on right there. Obedience is what the Lord requires of us. Yet today, people not only are disobedient, they don't even want to believe in the Lord. I talked to a believer the other day. He's a believer, but he says, I just don't believe anymore. And I said, well, you're going to come under discipline. The Lord skins alive every son and daughter that he receives. And so uh, if you want that discipline, I'm, I'm going to get out of the way. But uh, if you want, you can just confess your sins, trust the Lord, and obey him. Do those things that are pleasing to him. Here we see that uh, Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Interesting, here uh, we have the uh, Mosaic Covenant mentioned in terms of three aspects, and yet it hasn't come into existence. And yet we have commandments like the Ten Commandments. We have the statutes, which are the spiritual law codes pertaining to sacrificial system, all of the offerings. And these would be taught in detail under the Mosaic Covenant in Exodus. But yet they're mentioned here. So obviously Abraham had the Ten Commandments, if you will, before they were actually written on the tables of stone. How about that? And the statutes, spiritual things, everything pertaining to later the priesthood and the offering system and all the sacrificial offerings and how they were to be done. And the laws. The laws, of course, extend, as we know, under the Mosaic Covenant, 613 laws. Did Abraham have all of those? Well, he probably had a Bible class and must have learned them because it says that he had them. He obeyed and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac lived in Gerar, and it continues on. And uh, the situation with Abimelech is described following. So we have the covenant, the, Mosaic, uh, the Abrahamic covenant extended to Isaac, Genesis 26, 1 through 5. How about Jacob? Well... Let's go see Jacob in chapter 35, Genesis 35. See, we're doing Bible study here. At this local church, we study the Bible and only the Bible and all the Bible all the time. That's what we should do as believers. I know there's political unrest. I know there's economic problems. I know there's all sorts of strange things going on in the world, but for us, the word of God and faith in him and his word and obedience to him supersedes any circumstances. So I don't teach on those circumstances other than peripherally. Here we have it. And so the covenant to Abraham extended to Isaac in 26 of Genesis and to Jacob in 35, 9 through 12. Genesis 35, verses 9 through 12. Then God appeared to Jacob. He got a personal visitation. Abraham got one. Isaac got one. Jacob got one. Moses had one. Other individuals in the Old Testament had visitations. And so God made his visible presence as a pre-incarnate appearance called a theophany. And God appeared to him again when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name, Yaakov, <laughs> that means the, the usurper or the chiseler. What a great name. Uh, so be careful if you name your child Jacob. You know, <laughs> that meant the one who uh, is slick, who is slippery, who uh, deceives or tricks. He tricked his brother, you see. At any rate, he changed his name. Your name, Jacob, uh, you will no longer be called Jacob, but Yisrael shall be your name. And that became the name of the people we call Israel. 
because it came from this individual when he got a name change. His name went from chiseler or slippery person, the one who usurps his brother's blessing, as it were, of the firstborn. He became Yisrael. Now, Israel, Israel in the Hebrew has two meanings. It means the, the one who struggles with God. Well, certainly Jacob struggled with God. Later on, we know that he wrestled with God, and that's when he got a dislocated hip. You know, he wasn't even playing football, but he got his hip dislocated, and he limped the rest of his life to remind him of that. And so uh, uh, he had a, a direct encounter with the Lord. And so Israel means the one who struggles with God. But it also can mean the one who struggles for God. Uh, and in the Hebrew, both are implied by the word Yisrael. So his name became Yisrael when we call the people uh, over in the land of Israel today, Israelites or Hebrews, we're recognizing that they struggle with God, struggle to accept his Messiah, and they struggle for him defending the land. And we must always, always, always support Israel. Good, bad, or indifferent, they are the people of God, and they will have the land in the future. They will have the King Jesus as ruling, and they will live in the land, the descendants of Abraham in the future. So never, ever be anti-Jewish. I know we say anti-Semitic, but there are more Semitic or Shemitic people than the Hebrews. Be not anti Hebrew, anti-Jewish, if you will, today. And so Israel shall be your name. But what I wanted to get here for, he says, okay, God also said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. Of course, eventually, King Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords in the future. And the land which I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken to him. And, of course, so we see that uh, this is the place where Jacob met with the Lord, and he named the place there that was spoken of as Bethel. Appropriate name. Beit means house. Uh, El is the first letters of Elohim. It means the house of God. That's where Isaac uh, uh, rather, Jacob met with him. So Genesis 35, 9 through 12, uh, is the uh, continuation, you might say, of the Abrahamic covenant through Isaac, through Jacob. All the Hebrew people are of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why they often say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant has one further extension, and that, of course, is under the Davidic covenant, which extends the royal line and leads towards Messiah. And we've already noted that. I think I held it up in the first hour. We have some copies here. This is uh, Dr. Tommy Ice put this chart together. We have it at our website under charts and graphs, and it has the various covenants and how they relate. It's really a great presentation. If you don't have one, you might pick one up here or go online, and uh, you can download this at the charts and graphs, and it shows the relationship of the Abrahamic covenant, the land grant, sometimes called the Palestinian covenant, and, of course, the new covenant, which is the covenant that Jeremiah spoke about, replacing the Mosaic covenant, but it still includes the latter portion of the Abrahamic covenant. So we might even say that the new covenant is actually part and parcel of the Abrahamic covenant. So we have the land portion, we have the people portion, Israel and all the nations, and the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. So this Abrahamic covenant goes all the way from almost 2000 BC down to the present time. 4,000 years ago, God promised that land. So people who think that the so-called Palestinians or any other group of people, Arab peoples, that they had the land first. They did not. Abraham was promised the land 4,000, nearly 4,000 years ago, and they're going to have it all. So they can fight about the West Bank or this portion or that portion or the Gaza Strip. I'm here to tell you Israel will have all of that land in the future. So don't you ever be anti-Jewish. Not ever. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Zola Levin on his show always closed with that phrase from the Psalms. Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. All 
all of our prayer should always be for Jerusalem. Right now they have a good leader. Uh, he's met with Joel uh, Rosenberg. I'm sure he's had the gospel presented. I don't know that he can present the fact that he is messianic, even if he is, because he's got people who are not. They're Orthodox Jews. Uh, he's got Messianic Jews, and he's got people who are anti-God in every way. And so he's got the balance, five balls, as it were, in the air uh, to keep that nation going. But he is a conservative. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Well, that's this verse. And so we have the fact that Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob, the co-heirs, through the verses we have just noted, we have here <clears throat> uh, uh, su kleronomos. Kleronomos is the word for inheritance. Sug means together with. So they are co-inheritors, inherit together or joint heirs. By the way, we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and we receive all the blessings that Jesus Christ receives in his glorified resurrection body. The only thing we don't get is we don't get deity. We don't become God or little gods. But everything that Jesus has in his humanity, but his glorified, resurrected humanity, seated at the right hand of the Father, we possess those same blessings and the glory that will accrue to us in that resurrection body. Co-heirs or inheritors of the same promise. We have here the in the pronoun autos used here uh, as reflecting back on the promise of the previous ones, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same promise. The Greek word is ep angelia. Angelia, the word we get for angels, where we get it, but actually angelia means a message. And we have epi plus angelia. It's upon the message. And in translation, it becomes promise. They were heirs of the same promise. Well, I think we're now ready for verse 10, and verse 10 continues these first three verses about Abraham. And he was living. He was living. We have the imperfect tense, which indicates ongoing action. The middle voice indicates that he did it. He did his living there in the land. The indicative mood again indicates reality. And he was looking for here, he was looking for a city. He was looking for a city. The word polis means a city. Now we know what that city is. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. And he never got to see it. Uh, he never saw it in his day. He was looking for that city. He lived in tents all of his life. We're going to get to go there at the rapture. John 14, 1 through 4, Jesus said he's going to take us to that place. Where he is, there we be also. We're going to go to that city, and when Abraham gets to come in at the second advent and gets his resurrection body, along with all the Old Testament saints, tribulational martyrs, we'll get to salute him. Hello, Abraham. Hello, Job. Hello, Moses. We get to see Isaac. There's Isaac. Jacob. Okay, we get to see what a, what a, what a great time of fellowship we're going to have. They are, of course, uh, the friends of the bridegroom. We, of course, are the bride of Christ. And we will all sit down at a table. I don't know how. In the heavenly Jerusalem, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Whoo! That doesn't excite you. I give up. Father God, thank you again for another opportunity. For that one person who's here this morning without Christ, without hope. Without eternal life, again, you had them in mind when you sent your son into human history. Undiminished deity, the God, became man through the incarnation and the virgin birth. And he lived a perfectly sinless life, therefore qualifying him as the second Adam, if you will. Adam bringing sin into the world. One man, the God-man, Savior, Jesus Christ, taking sin out of the world by his death on the cross, substitutionary atonement, fulfilling all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament from Adam all the way through Abraham, through all the sacrifices of the Levitical system, once and for all time, once and for all people, Jesus died on the cross for your sin and my sin. And because of that, you can have everlasting life by simply believing in Jesus Christ. Won't you do it before you leave? For God so loved the world that he gave his only called, his only chosen son, his only born son, that whosoever, anybody, that includes you, anybody would believe, would not perish, 
eternal separation from God, but have everlasting life. Won't it be a great thing to join with Jesus Christ and all of us who know him and have come to be part of the family, the royal family, if you please, forever. You can join that family right now, right where you sit in the privacy of your soul, simply expressing the words, I'm believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died on the cross for my sin and that because of that I can have everlasting life forgiveness of sins, and a seat at the heavenly Jerusalem marriage supper of the Lamb. What a great thing you can have. Won't you do it? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John said, those who believe in Jesus Christ may know that they have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Jesus said, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, again, thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever. Thank you for these principles. Help them to nourish us and challenge and motivate us as we go through the week to come. And we pray this in the mighty and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.